upon. I said it's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Anybody excited about what Jesus is doing today? I want to tell you that the Lord has strength when we're weary. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.
Grace is more than enough. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all.
to your arms because those of us who have an experience with Christ and have a relationship with Him, I mean, what better place to be than in the presence of the Lord? What better place to be than in the arms of the Lord? But I want to tell you that if you haven't been in relationship with Him, you know, running into the arms of the Lord could perhaps be a little bit of a scary proposition because I've discovered that most people that aren't in relation with Him, they're not really sure they want to be with Him because they're a little concerned about what they're going to have happen when they get in His presence. But I want to tell you this. If you'll just, you don't have to run to Him. If you'll just take a step toward Him, here's what will happen. He won't wait for you to run to Him. He'll run to you because He wants to be with you so much. We've sung about his grace. We've sung about his power. We've sung about his love. I want to tell you that all of that is just simply manifestation of who he is and how he wants to work in your life. And maybe you walked in this place today and you came in with a concern or with a burden. Maybe there's something that's really troubling you. Maybe there's something that's just really wrong in your world. you and he cares about what's going on he cares about all the details of your life he cares about where you are he cares about your struggles he, can, he cares about your doubts he cares about your concerns he cares about um, about every part of your life and his invitation to you today is if you'll just give him a chance he will come and he will touch your life right at the point of your greatest need so maybe you came in with a need and you say, I need God's touch. I, I don't even really know what that'll look like. I just know I got to have some help that's bigger than I am. And if that's you, could I just see your hand? Would you be so bold as to say, yeah, I got to have 
that kind of help. Yeah, lots of hands. Would you just kind of keep them up for a second? Because I want people around you to notice your hand raised because I want to give them a chance to get to where you are. Would you do that? Would you move to somebody that's got their hand raised? And if a bunch of you are in a wad together, that's a good southern term, a wad. You know, if you're in a wad together and all of you got your hands raised, y'all just kind of lay hands on each other, okay? Because we may not be able to get everybody to you. And would you just pray one for another? Just talk to the Lord and say, God, we need your help today. We need you to show up big time. Go ahead and pray one for another. pastor of a little tiny church over here in the center part of the state, and uh, that was in the really some of the heyday of, of some southern gospel music in the church, and in those days, I played piano for a southern gospel quartet. Yeah, we cut a record. Thankfully, I think all of those copies have been destroyed, so none of it can be used against me. <laughs> but this guy sang tenor in the quartet. And we, we met up. He's now pastor of a church out in Las Vegas. So he was at this conference that I was teaching at. And he told me this story that I thought, I just got to, I have to share this testimony. Because it's been a couple of years ago now that his wife became very ill and died. She was dead for probably about 45 minutes. And they were working with her. They were trying to resuscitate her. They, um, they shocked her heart seven times. And those of you that know anything about how they function, and they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't shock you seven times. But he was just standing there in the room saying, no, you know, I'm praying. I'm, I'm declaring life over, over this lady. And she woke up. And I, 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 she was with him. I saw her. She's doing okay. God is still doing miracles. What was even more fun was as he talked about that, he said, um, he said, it wasn't just her. He said, but there, within a space of just a few days while she was there and up recovering and, and getting ready to go home and everything, there were four people in that hospital that God raised from the dead. Now, you, you know, 
You guys can believe that if you want to, or you can look at me like a calf looking at a new gate saying, I don't know about that. But uh, I'm just telling you, God still does that kind of stuff. So I don't know how impossible your situation seems right now. I just want to tell you, God's still up to something big when you give him a chance. One of them, one of these was so much fun because uh, there, was a, there was a guy that was on life support and they were just waiting for them to come in and pull the plug. And, you know, they were calling all the family and, you know, it, it's, it's over. They're just going to take him off of life support. And the wife happened to see my friend out in the hall of the hospital and said, wait a minute, I know you. You're the guy that prayed for his wife. She said, would you pray for my husband? He said, yeah, I'll pray for your husband. And so he prayed. And he said, I thought we were just going to pray there in the waiting room. No, she grabbed him and took him back to ICU. He said they had machines everywhere. So he couldn't even get get where he was. He just kind of had to reach through the machinery just to be able to touch the man. And they were just waiting to pull the plug. Said he prayed. And the next thing you know, the guy opens his eyes. And then he starts fighting, and he had to say, no, calm down, wait a minute, you're in ICU, you'll be okay, just, and grab the doctors and grab the nurses to come in here and unhook some of this machinery. I'm telling you, God's still up to big stuff when you give him a chance. Now, I just tell you that kind of stuff because somebody walked in today, and your faith if we could, you know, take the dipstick and measure your faith, you're about a quart low today. You know, I'm not sure how you measure faith, you know, but, but you're low. And I'm just telling you that to build your faith to say that God is no respecter of persons. He is not changed since that time. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he cares about the details of your life just as much as he cares about the details of my friend's wife. Would anybody dare to believe that today? Would you dare to believe that? I I just got this on my heart. It's not on our list. They may be able to find it somewhere in the middle of me singing, but you probably know it anyway. The verse starts like this, and it says, As I walked through the door, I sensed his presence. And I knew this was the place where love abounds. For this is the temple. Jehovah God abides here. We are standing. On holy ground, Oh, 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 oh. 
Lord and thank him for his presence in this house. Go ahead, just talk to the Lord out of your heart. Say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you you're still a God of miracles. I thank you that you'll still do miracles for me if I'll put my trust in you.
How many of you can testify God's brought you from a mighty long way? I remember David singing in Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined his ear unto me. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my going, and he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise unto our God. I'm telling you, God has brought us from a mighty long way, has he not? Why don't we just stand and give him that praise today of which he is worthy today? Come on, let's give him thanks. Why don't you just clap your hands and rejoice because God has brought you from a mighty long way.
I'm going to ask you to remain standing for just a few moments and take your Bibles and we'll look today into the New Testament to the Gospel of Mark. Are you there? Mark chapter 8. We'll begin at verse 34. And he, that is Jesus, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I'm so thankful for this time that we can come together in your house to worship. I'm thankful for your presence that we've sensed. And now, Lord, I ask that you will open our hearts so that we will hear that which the Spirit will say to us in the midst of the preaching. I pray, O Lord, that you will send your Holy Spirit in a new and a fresh way to bring understanding and revelation to our hearts. And if there is one listening to this message that is not walking in right relationship with you, I pray that today will be their day of turnaround. I lift up to you other life-giving churches in this city, and I pray blessing upon them. I pray especially for our loved ones that are not walking with you. Draw them to you, Lord. Don't let one of them be lost, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Have you ever stopped to think about how much you're worth? No, I don't mean in material assets. I don't mean the number, you know, when you, when you say I've got this much money in the bank and this much property. And the, you know, I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I don't, I'm not talking about the number you use when you go to purchase insurance, you know, and you're trying to insure everything for law, against loss. I, I don't mean the number you use when you're trying to get a loan. You know, you try to get a loan, you try to throw everything in there so you look like your bottom line is better than it really is. Oh, you've never done that, huh? Oh, you have done that, but you just didn't want to admit it. I see. You know, some people that love you very much will tell you that you're priceless, but that's not what I'm talking about either. I'm talking today about the actual dollar value of your body. Some time ago, a group got together and analyzed all the minerals and all of the elements that are present in the human body. If you could take your body and and break it down into its component parts, you would find the bulk of your body, the majority of your body is, yeah, 65% of your body is oxygen, 18% is carbon, 10% is hydrogen, 3% nitrogen, 1.5% calcium, 1% phosphorus, 0.35% potassium, 0.25% sulfur, 0.15% sodium, 0.15% chlorine, 0.05% magnesium, 0.0004% iron, 0.00004, did I get enough zeros in there? One, two, three, yeah, four zeros, 4% iodine. And there's also some trace amounts of other elements such as silicon and manganese. If you were to take all of these elements that are in your body, in the amounts that are in your body, price them according to the market value, and then add them all together, the total worth 
of the elements in each human body on the planet is about, drum roll please, wait for it, $4.50. Why don't you look at somebody there around you and tell them, you're worth at least $4.50 today. Don't let anybody tell you you're worthless. <laughs> yeah. Not quite, you know, let's round it up, $5, okay? The market's going good now, you know, so $5. <laughs> That's interesting to me because every year, literally millions of dollars are spent in this country to clothe and to improve the looks and to include, improve the smell of these bundles whose value is less than $5. What we spend to clothe and beautify ourselves is nothing compared to what we spend to repair these bodies of ours when they malfunction. Amen. Between the insurance costs and the co-pays and the out-of-pocket expenses, it all adds up to an enormous drain on the budget. Just this week. We had a meeting around the church with our insurance broker because it's getting time for our health insurance renewal for the church employees. I hate those meetings because it doesn't seem to matter what you do. It, every year it's just more and more and more. We spend an incredible amount of money every year just to keep operational and functional these bodies whose net worth is about $5. We live and we act and we order our lives as if this was all we had available. When this life, which how many of you know it hangs by a very precarious thread anyway, when this life is threatened, we spare no expense to squeeze the very last drop out of it. We run to specialists. We go to the finest facilities. We try the latest techniques. Nothing is too unreasonable if it will buy us at least one more day of life. Now, the fact that we expend so much time and energy in caring for these bodies of ours, that's not really the problem. But the fact that we have this tendency to live as if these bodies and as if today is all we have, that's a big problem. You know, the message of our world is a message of present tense. It's a message that tells us live for today because that's all you have and that's all that's really important is right now. But in the midst of a world that is focused on right now, the Bible steps up and it very boldly begins to remind us there is more to life than what we're able to see. There's more than birth and school and graduation and family, and career, and retirement. But you have an eternal dimension to your life. Listen, the real you isn't the body you can see. That's only the house in which the real you lives. But the real you, the thing that gives you value, is not this $4.50 house that you're in, covering that you have, but it's the soul that lies within you. That eternal soul is that part of you that's going to live on and on long after this body has returned to the dust from whence it came. The problem is there's too many people living only for today and ignoring tomorrow. So many people are planning for retirement, they're forgetting about eternity. <clears throat> but I came to this pulpit today to remind you that you have an eternal destiny. You have a part of you that will never die, and that part is so much more valuable than your physical body ever imagines it could be. Yes. As we turn our attention to the passage that forms the text for the message today, <clears throat> we find here Jesus talking about the value of your eternal soul. And as we look at these verses, there are three things that I want to highlight for you today. First of all, 
as we look at this passage, I want to tell you about the fabulous treasure. The fabulous treasure. That essential part of who you are, that eternal soul, is a treasure worth more than all the rubies, the diamonds, the stocks, the bonds, the buildings, the automobiles, all the treasures of a million worlds like this one. Let me quickly tell you five reasons why your soul is so valuable. First of all, there's creativity. One thing that makes anything valuable is creativity. That is, who is it that created it? You know, if you happen to have a painting signed by Raphael or by Picasso, first of all, I want to come to your house. But if you have a painting signed by one of the great masters, it's valuable. If Michelangelo does a sculpture, then that creativity is there, and that's what causes it to have great value. The reason your soul is of such value is because of who created it. It was created by the Lord God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we're told the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's the reason Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that we are his workmanship. Listen, when God created everything else in this universe, he did it by his spoken word. I don't, know if we are, I don't know if we can capture this. I don't know that I can do this justice the way it needs to be done. Do you understand that when God created life of humans, when God created man and woman, that there was so much more involved and so it, it, creating man was so much more difficult than anything else God created? It was much more difficult than God speaking and saying, let there be light. It was more difficult than God saying, let there, be, let there be earth and water. It was more difficult than God saying, let there be birds of the air and let there be fish in the sea and let there be cattle of the fields. And I'll tell you why it was more difficult. Because with each thing, remember mankind is the last part of God's creation. He's the crowning glory of God's creative energy. But by the time God gets to mankind, he's got to create a being that can now function in the midst of everything else he's created. He has to create a being that has limitations. He creates mankind in such a way that, he, that we require a certain mix of oxygen. He, he requires it so that what we exhale, the plants inhale. And what the plants exhale, we inhale. He creates it in such a way so that it all fits together and we all get formed and fashioned. When God made us, he was limiting himself saying, I've got to create this being that's going to be able to function within these narrow parameters that I've set out for him. That's so much more difficult than just simply saying, let there be light. We got light everywhere. But no, this, this man has to function with light day and night, the evening and the morning. This man has to function with, within certain parameters of temperature. This man has to function with certain things to eat and with a, with a certain amount of water to take in. And, and with, with, do you see how God has done in this creativity? What a, what a masterpiece we are. What a masterpiece you are. You are so valuable because everything else in the universe was spoken into being, but you were fashioned by the master's hand. You are his workmanship. That word means you are the crowning work of God's creative genius. What that means is you are God's masterpiece. Some of you are looking at me like, I don't feel much like a masterpiece today. You know, I'm carrying a few extra pounds and I've got a few extra wrinkles. And no, you are a masterpiece of God. That's why your soul is so valuable because of creativity. But there's another reason. Not only creativity, but potentiality. Not only what you are, but what you could be. Amen. See, sitting in your seat right now are really three people.
Some of you looking around like, wait a minute. Yeah, there's the person you are right now. There's the person you could be for degradation and despair if you choose to follow Satan. And there's the person you will be if you follow Christ. See, God has a plan for you. And that plan is to transform you into the likeness of His Son. And if you surrender your life to Him and you follow Him, one day you're going to be conformed to His own image. You're going to be like Jesus. You know, the story is told of the great artist Michelangelo, how that one day he came upon a block of marble. And he walked around that block of marble and he looked at it from every angle. And finally he stepped back And he said to the person with him, he said, there's an angel in that block of marble, and I'm going to set him free. When the great master looked at that marble, he didn't just see a block of stone, but he saw a work of art. He didn't see what was. He saw potentiality. He saw a possibility. I want to tell you, that's what God sees when he looks at you. (laughs) (coughs) Don't get alarmed. That's what happens when you travel coast to coast. (coughs) See, nobody else sees the potential in you. Nobody sees it. Your parents don't see it. Oh, yeah, they want good things for you, but they don't really see the potential in you. Your spouse doesn't see it. (coughs) Your teacher doesn't see it. But I tell you what, God sees it. God sees the potential in your life. He sees not what you are. He sees what you could be. And that's what makes you valuable. There's creativity. There's potentiality. Then I'll tell you a third thing that makes you valuable. There's durability. How long will it last? (laughs) A number of years ago, I, I needed to replace the automobile I was driving. So... I looked around, (coughs) I test drove a number of vehicles, finally settled on one. The price of that vehicle was actually more than I'd ever paid for a vehicle, but it was actually an excellent deal for this particular automobile. And it's been my practice when I purchase a vehicle, I always purchase one that's pre-owned because of the depreciation. I don't want to drive it off the lot and then it suddenly be worth a whole lot less than I just paid for it. So that's just me. You do whatever you want to do and I'm not heaping condemnation on anybody. And besides, if everybody bought like I did, then new cars would never get bought. And we got people in the audience that sell cars and so they'd be out of jobs. So y'all keep buying them, all right? When I took everything into consideration, though, I concluded this particular vehicle would suit my needs. I, I could afford it, so I made the purchase. The vehicle, <clears throat> the vehicle is a 1999 model, and it has proven to be very reliable, very good means of transportation. In fact, if you go out in the parking lot right now, you will see it sitting out there. It's not new by any means. There's some spots and there's some dings on the body, but it still looks pretty good, especially for an automobile built in 1999. It handles good, the ride's comfortable, gas mileage is acceptable, it has over 278,000 miles on it, and it's still going strong. Praise God. <clears throat> there is a God, that's right. <laughs> so you live right and God will take, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's going strong. However, the book value of that vehicle is practically nothing. If somebody were to hit me, the cost of repair would probably be more than the value of the car. <clears throat> I really like the fact that it's paid for, and it has been paid for for a number of years. I really like the fact that it's dependable, and it still looks pretty good as it does. But at the same time, I know that vehicle's not going to last forever. In fact, as I drive down the highway, I sometimes find myself, I almost feel like I'm cheating on my car. (laughs) Because I find myself looking at other cars to see if there's something out there that I might like the looks of because I know that sooner or later, I'm going to once again be in the market for another automobile. And so, you know. 
<laughs> I don't think there's any question I've gotten my money's worth out of this car. But as good as it's been, it's not going to last. What a contrast with your soul. See, your soul is valuable because of its durability. You don't have to worry about the warranty running out on your soul. You don't have to worry about your soul depreciating in value. You don't have to worry about your soul wearing out and having to trade it in on a newer model somewhere down the line. Your soul will last forever. Long after the sun and the moon and the stars have grown cold and dark, your soul will still exist. Your soul will go on and on, timeless, endless, dateless, measureless, throughout all eternity. It's creativity, potentiality, durability. I'll tell you something else that gives anything value, and that's rarity. If something's rare, then it's valuable. That's why gold is more valuable than dirt. Not just because it's prettier, but because it's rare. That's why diamonds are valuable, because they're not lying around all over the ground. Things that people collect, the fewer of them there are, the more valuable they are. That's why your soul is so valuable, because of its rarity. It's because there's only one you. God never makes duplicates. He never makes clones. He never makes copies. He only makes originals. You are the handiwork of Almighty God. You are His masterpiece. There will never be another just like you. Let me tell you one other thing makes you so valuable. Desirability. If you want to know how much something is worth, bottom line, it's worth what someone is willing to pay for it. If you have your house appraised, the appraiser doesn't care how much you paid for it. He doesn't care that you recently had it painted. He doesn't care that you've lived in it for 20 years and you've got all of these memories about raising your family and all the sentimental attachment. The appraised value is simply what someone in today's market is willing to pay for it. The question is, does somebody want it? And how much Will he pay for it? That, that's the question. Let me tell you how valuable your soul is based on its desirability. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things, like silver or gold, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. God thinks your soul is so valuable that he was willing to give his only begotten son to die so that he could redeem your soul. Jesus thinks your soul is so valuable he was willing to endure the humiliation and the cruelty of the cross to pay the ultimate price for the salvation of your soul. The Holy Spirit thinks your soul is so valuable he's willing to deal with you, he's willing to call you, he's willing to convict you, he's willing to chase you down in order to bring you to a place of repentance. Your body may only be worth $4.50 today, but you have something that is of infinite worth and value. It's your eternal soul. There is a fabulous treasure, and it's your soul. Then I want you to see not only the fabulous treasure, but I want you to see the foolish transaction. That's what Jesus is talking about here in our text. He's talking like a businessman, and he's talking about profit and loss. Look again at verse 36. He says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Jesus is talking very logically and very rationally here, and he wants you to understand what a foolish transaction this would be if you were to barter away your soul for the hopes of gaining this world. There's three reasons I could think of why this would be such a foolish decision. First of all, it's a foolish decision because you can't gain this world. Many have tried it, and none have been successful. Alexander the Great tried it. Napoleon tried it. Hitler tried it. Maybe you're an entrepreneur. Maybe you're a real estate mogul. Maybe, maybe you're a, a stock wizard. Maybe you're able to amass vast treasures and vast riches. 
but all you've really gained is a little bit of this world's goods. Think of the richest man that you can think of in this world today. He doesn't own it all. I'm amazed at how cheaply some people will sell out. Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You know, some people refuse to follow Jesus because of what they think they're going to have to give up. But nobody ever gains the whole world. Second, even if you could gain this whole world, you couldn't keep it. Everything you have that you call your own, newsflash, it's not really yours. It's passing away. You'll hold it for a little while, but time and death will eventually take it all away. If you, want to, if you want to know how much you really have, try this exercise sometime. Take a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle. On the left-hand side, list everything you have. All your earthly possessions, all your resources, all your wealth, everything that's of value. Put it down. Write it all down. And then move over from that column to the right-hand column everything you have that money can't buy and death can't take away. Everything that winds up in the right column is your true wealth. I was reading some time ago and came across a story about Charlemagne. You know, he was the king of France somewhere around the 8th or 9th century. They called him Charlemagne the Great. Anybody remember about Charlemagne the Great? You studied that in, in high school history? Okay. He was a very powerful, very wealthy man. He lived in a fine palace. He had the best of everything. But Charlemagne the Great died. He wasn't greater than death. They buried him with a, in a great funeral with pomp and pageantry. Many years later, some archaeologists entered his tomb. What they found was that Charlemagne had been buried with treasures all around him. According to the account that I read, he was buried dressed in his royal palace robes, sitting on a throne, complete with a crown upon his head. But by the time these archaeologists opened up that tomb and went inside... The body of this once great ruler had decayed. The flesh was all gone. The crown that was sitting on his head had slipped down over his skull, was sitting at a crazy angle. The skeleton was sitting there, and he had an open Bible in his lap. And there was a bony finger on the verse that I'm preaching from today. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Charlemagne didn't keep it, and you won't keep it either. It matters not who you are. doesn't matter who your parents are. doesn't matter what your background is. doesn't matter who you're connected to. You can't gain the whole world, and if you could gain it, you couldn't keep it. Not only that, but if you could gain the whole world, if you could keep it, it wouldn't satisfy you. You know, I'm told, I don't know this for sure, but I'm told that money can buy a wife but it can't buy love. Money can buy four years of college, but it can't buy an education. Money can hire a doctor, but it can't buy health. Money can pamper your body, but it cannot save your soul. It can't satisfy the deepest longings of your life. Pleasures don't satisfy, possessions don't satisfy, philosophy doesn't satisfy. You were made for God. Your soul was made for a relationship with Him. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. That's why Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? Think about the immensity of this kind of love. First of all, I want to tell you th this kind of loss that we would have in a foolish transaction. Think about the immensity of the loss. First of all, it's an immeasurable loss. And I deal with people all the time who sustain losses. It's painful when you lose your possessions. It's painful when you lose your health. It's painful when you lose a loved one to death. But as tragic and as painful as those losses are, they pale in comparison to the horrible tragedy of losing your eternal soul. Not only is it an immeasurable loss, it's an irreplaceable loss. You know, some things you can replace if you lose them. Others you can find a substitute for if you lose them. But you will never replace and you will never find a substitute for your soul. The loss of your soul is an immeasurable loss. It's an irreplaceable loss. I want to tell you it's also an irreversible loss. 
There are no second chances. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 means when it says, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That's what Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 means when it says, It is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Listen, listen. On the day when you stand before the Lord, it will be too late to stand before Him and say, Have mercy. On judgment day, it'll be too late to plead for forgiveness. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to surrender to the Lord. If you try to wait until judgment day, it'll be too late. You'll be lost beyond hope, beyond eternity, beyond help. It's an irreversible loss. And I'd also tell you it's really an inexcusable loss. There's absolutely no reason why anybody listening to this message should be lost. Jesus wants to save you. Jesus is willing to save you. Anybody that wants to be saved can be saved today. That's why verse 35 of our text tells us, whoever wishes to lose his life or to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Think about what it's going to be like on Judgment Day when you stand before the Lord. You may stand there and say, Lord, I have an excuse. <clears throat> I didn't know which church to join. I mean, there were so many churches. I mean, those, re those religious people should have, gotten to get, should have gotten together. But, you know, they couldn't make up their minds which was the right church. And so I didn't know which one to believe. But the Lord is going to answer and say, I didn't say believe on the church. I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. Well, Lord, it was, it, it was those preachers. That Pastor John Morgan, I just couldn't stand him. I mean, I came to church on a Sunday morning to worship and be made to feel good, and he talked to me about losing my soul. I didn't like him at all. He was loud, talked too fast, went too long. Oh, I get it. I don't think I had I just didn't get anything out of what he had to say. And the Lord will answer, I didn't say believe on the preacher. I said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. But God, I didn't have time. You know how busy I was. I, you know, I was trying to make a living. I was trying to raise children. I was, I was just taking care of business. And the Lord would say, well, you had time that Sunday when Pastor John opened the Bible and he preached to you and he pleaded with you to give your heart to Jesus. You had time that morning. But, but, but Lord, I didn't want to be a hypocrite. So, so I wasn't going to go down there until I was sure I could live it. And he'll answer, I didn't say believe on yourself and your ability. I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. I'm telling you, there is no reason for you not to be saved and to be saved today. If you lose your soul, it's an inexcusable loss. Suppose someone came to you and said, I have a proposition for you. And suppose they actually had the power to fulfill this particular proposition. Suppose they said, I have the ability to give you all of the wealth, all of the pleasure, all of the notoriety, all of the ease of this world. I have the ability to give you everything the world has to offer, and I'll give it to you if you'll just give me something in return. And you say, well, that sounds pretty good. What is it you want? If you'll just give me your little finger, I'll amputate your little finger, and you can have any and everything you want. Don't answer out loud. But how many of you would do it? I'm convinced there's a lot of people that would give up their little finger if they could have everything their heart desired. But then suppose he came along and raised the ante and said, I'll give you all of this stuff. I'll give you any and everything you want. But it'll cost you your hand. A lot of people would do that. They would. You probably know people like that. What if he kept raising the ante? Both hands. Both hands in one eye. Keep your hands, but both eyes. 
and your hearing. Or both hands, both eyes, both ears. Where would you draw the line? Where would you draw the line on that? L listen, dear friends. There are many, even some listening to this message right now, who are giving far more than that and getting far less. You're giving far more. You're giving your soul. Your soul is worth far more than your eyes and your hands and your ears. Listen to what Jesus says. Listen to the logic of Jesus. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? I've talked to you about the fabulous treasure. I've talked to you, that's, the, that's your soul. I've talked to you about the foolish transaction, bargaining, bargaining away your soul for the things of this world. And that brings me to the last point, and then I'm done. I want to take just a moment and talk about the fatal tragedy. There is no greater tragedy than to lose your soul for all eternity. Amen. I heard about a man somewhere around the turn of the 20th century who was a great artist. He was also a master chess player. This man painted a scene in which there was a young man playing chess with the devil. The young man was playing the white pieces, the devil the black. And the two are sitting in this painting, they're sitting facing each other across the chessboard, and the stakes of the game are very high. They're playing for the young man's soul. Now, I've never been much of a chess player. I'm not smart enough to play chess or to play it well. But those who are good at it, they can see several moves ahead and they can plan their strategy accordingly. You know, a good chess player, their mind can visualize every possible consequence of, their, of a particular move, and then they can determine how they will respond based on their opponent's move, and they can anticipate what's going to happen several moves ahead. And they strategize, and they plan, and they move their pieces that way. Well, in this painting, the pieces are arranged on the board in such a way that Satan, with a malevolent look on his face, has just moved his queen and has announced that in four moves it will be checkmate. The young man is sitting across from him. All the color is drained from his face. There's a look of despair and fear on his face. He knows he's played the devil at his game, and he's lost. Well, that particular painting hung in the gallery, and many would come from literally around the world to see it. Well, there was a man named Paul Morphy who lived in Louisiana. He was a master chess player, but he had retired from championship tournament play. He retired because of the great strain it was upon his mind to play that game at that level. And someone told him about the painting and persuaded him to go and see it. So he went to the gallery and he looked at it. And like any chess player, it didn't take long before he was soon drawn into the scene. You know, he's, he's looking at it and seeing how all the pieces are positioned. And as he looked at those pieces on the board, he soon found himself trying to figure out if maybe there was indeed a move the young man could make that would enable him to escape losing the game. As he studied that painting, he, he put himself in the position of the young man. And in his mind, he would move this piece, and then he would move that piece, and then he would stop and think what were the consequences of those moves. As he stood before that painting... Five minutes turned into ten. Ten minutes turned into twenty minutes. And Thirty minutes. An hour. Pondering. Thinking. Thinking. Trying one move in his mind after another. After what seemed like an eternity... He suddenly broke the silence of that museum with a shout. Hey, young man, make this move. Paul Morphy had figured out something that neither the original painter nor any of the other chess players before him had seen. He had figured out a way the young man could escape and win. The master saw the only move that could be made to allow him to escape. 
Now, I don't know enough about chess to tell you what that move was. But I do know something about God. And I know something about the ways of God and the things of God. And I came to this pulpit today to tell you this one thing. There's one move that you can make, and only one, that will enable you to escape from the clutches of your spiritual enemy. There's one move you can make that will save your soul for all eternity. Give your heart to Jesus. You can say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin and save me. I promise you on the authority of God's word, he will save you. And he'll keep you if you surrender your life to him. I want to invite you today, young man, make that move. Young lady, make that move. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I'm going to ask you to bow with me for a moment, please. In the quietness of this moment, I'm going to ask you to first of all examine your own heart. Do you know you're saved? Do you know you're walking in right relationship with the Lord? And then I'm going to ask you to help me today. If I, if I could do it, if, if we could take the time, but, but we can't. But if, if it were possible, I would go to every person in this room individually. I would take you over to the side where it was just you and me. And I would ask you, are you walking in right relationship with Jesus? Do you know you're saved today? I can't do that. The logistics of it is, is not possible here today. So what I can't do by going to everybody, I'm going to ask you to help me with. And I'm going to ask you to very reverently, please, this is, I'm, this is the most serious that I've been all day long. I'm going to ask you to very seriously take a moment. And I'm going to ask you to be that person that looks at your neighbor looks at the person beside you, around you, close to you. And would you ask that person, in all seriousness, do you know you're in right relationship with Jesus? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Are you saved? Do you know that you're walking in right relationship with Him? If they say yes, just simply say, thank the Lord. If they can't answer honestly yes, if they're not sure, or if they would say no, would you ask them a follow-up question? Would you ask them, will you go with me? I'll go with you. You won't have to go alone. I'll go with you, and we'll move forward, and we'll find a place to pray, and we'll give our heart to Jesus today. All across this house, would you help me with that invitation right now? Would you do that? Would you talk to those people beside you? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Do you know you're saved? Is your heart surrendered to Christ? Would you do that? I'm not playing. This is the most important question you will ever be asked and the most important answer you will ever give. Something that affects your eternal soul and your eternal destiny. Are you surrendered to Christ? Thank you. Thank you for helping me with that. I want you to stand, please.
If there's someone in this house today and you couldn't answer yes, if your answer is, I'm not sure, if your answer is no, I want to plead with you. Won't you come to Jesus today? Won't you surrender your heart to him? Your soul is the most valuable part of you. Won't you take care of that today? Get that part right. I'm not going to beg and plead. I'm not going to twist your arm. But for just a moment, if you want to surrender your heart to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to just take the hand of your neighbor that said they'd come with you. I want to come and kneel at one of these altars. And then I want to ask you to join me as a congregation in praying this prayer. Let's say it together. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I deserve judgment. But I need mercy. I want to be saved. Jesus, you died to save me. You promised to save me if I would trust in you. I do trust you. Today, I turn from my sin. I turn to you, Lord Jesus. Today, now and forever, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Save me, Jesus. And help me not to be ashamed of you. Because you died for me, I will live for you if you will help me. Lord Jesus, you died to save me. You promised to save me. And right now, I surrender my life to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Why don't we just thank the Lord for the promise of his salvation today?